Hello again, everybody. This will be an overview of diabetes mellitus, and we're going to be focusing here primarily on type 2 diabetes because this is internal medicine, and we focus on adults, and adults tend to have type 2 diabetes. Okay, so we will talk about type 1 diabetes a little bit more when we get to insulin regimens, and certainly I have some talks in my pediatric talks on type 1 diabetes. We're going to be primarily focused here on type 2 diabetes, super, super common, comes up all the time in real life, and certainly will come up on your exams. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated and certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you will get updates. As I put more and more videos up, you can sign up for alerts and whatnot. So uh, yeah, so thanks everybody. All right, well, let's uh, just do a quick uh, overview of what diabetes is. So 10% of Americans are affected with diabetes. 9% um, are going to have type 2 and 1% are going to have type 1. Now type 1 usually shows up in childhood. So we're talking you know, seven, eight-year-olds, uh, maybe teenagers, pretty rare for it to show up for the first time in adults. Um, so what you're going to be looking for here as a classic patient is polyuria, polydipsia in a, um, a lean child. Now, this is autoimmune in origin, so it's completely different from type 2, uh, which is insulin resistance. So this comes from being overweight for a long period of time. Um, and so th in this case, the problem is not so much making insulin. However, it will become a problem later on. The problem initially is not making insulin, it's responding to it. Um, now, there are a number of strategies we can use to, to treat this, um, but that's the gist of it. There are a number of complications of diabetes, uh, which we will talk about um, the acute complications. And then when I talk about outpatient management, we'll talk about some of the more chronic complications. So this is how diabetes tends to present. Now, most of the time when we diagnose diabetes, it's on screening. Um, it's a patient, you know they're going to get diabetes, they're overweight, they don't take care of themselves, and eventually they get type 2 diabetes. Now, not everyone, you know, some people do take care of themselves and they get it. Most of the time, though, it's going to be in someone where you kind of expect it. Um, so polyuria, you got glucose spilling into the urine. It pulls water in, holds water. You got a higher urine volume. Polydipsia, they're dehydrated. They're peeing a lot. They're losing water, so they're going to be thirsty. And polyphagia, their cells aren't getting glucose. Their cells think they're hungry, and so they decide they need to eat more. Um, it's all for naught, though, especially with type 1 diabetes, because they're not going to get any of that sugar in. All right, so this is one of the ways that you can go about it if you suspect diabetes. The first thing you can do is get a hemoglobin A1C. It comes back. If it's more than 6.5, diabetes. You're done. If it's less than 5.7, no diabetes. If it's between 5.7 and 6.5, then what you're going to do is a fasting glucose test or an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, and where we go from there is just, is it abnormal or not? Um, so... Where we go into diabetes territory is if the fasting plasma glucose is 125 or higher or if the oral glucose tolerance test is 200 or higher. You should know the fasting plasma glucose being more than 125 or higher um, as diagnostic of diabetes. Now, if you're doing a screening test and you're getting a fasting glucose um, and it comes back, let's say 135, is that a diagnosis of diabetes? No. Nope. You got to get it twice. Okay, so in this case, it was fine because we started with the A1C, then we got the fasting glucose. However, if you're screening them with a fasting glucose, then you need to repeat it. Uh, and you need to have two abnormal results. So once you've diagnosed a patient with diabetes, then the next step is to get a hemoglobin A1C level. Now, in this algorithm, if we suspected diabetes, we already got the A1C. However, if you're screening them, you likely just did a, a fasting glucose twice, and then your next step would be an A1C. And the reason that that's important is that there are three ranges of A1C levels that will help us dictate therapy. And remember, the A1C tells us how good their glucose has been over the last three months. So if they decided, oh, I'll, I'm going to be seeing the doctor this week, I better get my glucose under control. Um, 
we will know if they're putting on a show for us because the A1C shows how they've been, how how good they've been over the last few months. Now, formerly, we used to tell newly diagnosed diabetic patients, go home, diet, exercise, cardio, um, low-carb diet, and come back in three months, and we'll see how you're doing. Now, we start everybody on metformin as long as it's not contraindicated. Um, so it's going to be lifestyle modifications plus metformin. What are the contraindications to metformin? Primarily severe renal failure, advanced cirrhosis. So at less than 7.5 A1C, we just do monotherapy, and typically that's metformin. At 7.6 to 9, we'll usually start with dual therapy where we do metformin and often one of those SGLT2 inhibitors, which we'll talk about. And if they're more than 9, then the question is, do they have complications? If they have complications, we're going to go right into insulin. If they do not, then we can do triple therapy. Uh, now, the target A1C, uh, which is important because we need to know if, we're, if we have them on a regimen, are they well controlled? That's going to vary depending on the source. So the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinologists say 6.5 or less as the target. Uh, however, there are risks that come into play. So if you're dealing with a young patient who's got a long life ahead of them, yeah, we want to keep them well controlled to avoid complications. If, however, you're dealing with a 75-year-old, our bigger concern is not them developing retinopathy. Our bigger concern is the possibility that they could develop hypoglycemia. So we tend to be a little bit more lax. These are um, some examples of the hyperglycemic drugs. I included all the most important classes here, uh, but I don't have, obviously, every medication uh, under each category. So metformin is the cornerstone of therapy for type 2, as we already talked about. It's got a pretty complex mechanism. Big contraindications are severe renal disease and advanced cirrhosis. The major adverse effect is lactic acidosis. Good to know. Don't need to know the mechanism. SGLT2 inhibitors are a fairly new class of drug. Uh, these are The way they work is they block glucose reuptake in the kidneys. Um, so they're essentially inducing a glucose urea, so you lose that excess sugar. Um, the problem is once you've got sugar in the urine, what's going to happen? Just like anywhere you have too much sugar, you can get an infection, right? And you get bacteria proliferating. So UTI is a possibility. Fournier gangrene is a possibility. And then there's something called euglycemic DKA. Don't worry about that. Probably not going to come up. Uh, now, this is known to be beneficial to patients with uh, congestive heart failure, and it also is known to uh, delay progression to diabetic nephropathy. So this is a common one to give if you can't give metformin as monotherapy or if you're doing dual therapy to add on top of metformin. The GLP-1 agonists are also similarly used as either an adjunct or an alternative. This has some really good weight loss properties. The downside to this is that you have to take it as a subcutaneous injection, and a lot of patients don't like that. Another downside is that it is expensive. Um, now, the one that you don't need to take by injection is called semaglutide. Um, that's also known as ozempic, and it's also now either recently or already has been approved uh, for just weight loss in anybody. Um, obese, obviously. Uh, adverse effects, acute pancreatitis is probably the biggest one. Another one is medullary thyroid cancer. So if a patient has a personal history, perhaps even a family history of medullary thyroid cancer, you want to avoid these. Now, the DPP-4 inhibitors work similarly to the GPL-1 agonists. Um, what you're doing here is you're preventing the breakdown of GLP-1. Um, so this is another one that you can use either as an adjunct or an alternative. Um, this one is weight neutral. However, uh, it has a lot fewer side effects. So that's kind of the benefit to this. The sulfonylureas, uh, they work on channels on the pancreatic beta cell. And um, by doing that, it increases the release of insulin. Uh, the problem with the sulfonylureas is that they induce weight gain. Um, and they also uh, are, they, they really predispose patients to hypoglycemia. So they're falling out of fa favor for that reason, uh, but you may see them from time to time. Uh, and then finally, the thiazolidine dienes or T TZDs, these all end in glitazone. I put the ending for all these uh, so you can remember it that way. 
Um, this increases insulin sensitivity. Uh, the problem here is that it causes you to retain water. And so if you already have a patient who's in congestive heart failure, you want to avoid that. Which of these is best for congestive heart failure? SGLT2 inhibitors, remember that. All right, so uh, remember then once you've got these patients on a medical regimen, you need to see them every three months to check their A1C. Okay, we're going to get an idea of their management. Um, and, you know, it, it may not improve right away, uh, but we want to make sure that we're seeing a positive, or I guess in this case, a negative uh, trend in their A1C. We want to get them down into the sixes. And remember also to manage the other comorbidities, including hypertension, which we generally will use an ACE inhibitor because it's nephroprotective. I will go into this more when I talk about outpatient management. Now, when do we use insulin? All type 1 diabetics, patients who have an A1C level of more than 9 with complications of diabetes, as I mentioned in the algorithm, and then patients who can't get their A1C levels under control with maximal therapy. Generally, that means a triple therapy. The downsides to insulin are obviously the inconvenience. Uh, it can be expensive, unfortunately, in this country, which is a whole moral quandary. Uh, and then uh, you have to be aware of your diet and exercise. Um, and so that generally means taking uh, using a glucometer multiple times a day. Uh, there are a variety of forms of insulin, which we're not going to go into here, but I do have a video on insulin regimens. In type 2 diabetes, uh, generally what they do if they need to go on insulin, they'll take a long-acting insulin in the morning, and then they'll take an uh, a shorter-acting insulin before each major meal of the day. And there are a variety of insulin regimens, which we will go into in a future talk. So to recap, diabetes mellitus is a progressive disorder um, that involves deficits either in insulin secretion or in uh, insulin response. Uh, type 2 diabetes is characterized by insulin resistance. Um, the pathophysiology is completely different from type 1, but the ultimate complications, the long-term complications, are the same. Symptoms, polyuria, polydipsia, and weight loss. However, we tend to pick these patients up, particularly type 2 diabetes, uh, through just routine uh, surveillance. And then uh, for diagnosis, fasting blood glucose level is the best initial test uh, if, uh, for, uh, particularly for screening. If you have a patient with symptoms, however, uh, you can do a hemoglobin A1C. That's fine as well. Um, the uh, next best step after diagnosing type 2 diabetes is going to be to get a hemoglobin A1C if you haven't already. Metformin and lifestyle modifications are first line, um, but then uh, depending on their control or their initial A1C, you may add on medications. Um, and please understand that metformin, the major contraindications to that are uh, advanced renal disease and advanced cirrhosis. If they've got that, you got to use a different drug in place of metformin.